it's an honor to be joined by Celeste Marcus and Leon Rizotier. Uh, they are they serve as editors of the new journal of culture and politics, Liberties. Uh, Celeste, Leon, Shalom. Shalom, oh, Shalom. Yes, uh, I should say that Celeste serves as the managing editor of the journal. And she is also the host of the podcast Liberties Talk associated with it. And Leon, aside from serving as the editor and founder of said journal, is, has also made a career for himself as one of the cameo actors in the TV show The Sopranos, as oh. well as the uh, literary editor of the magazine The New Republic for 30 or so years. Um, my first question to you both is that, how did you guys come to meet and how did the journal came to be? Uh, we met several years before the journal was conceived. Leon, can I say the meeting story and you'll say the origin yes, story? Sure, story? absolutely. There's so okay. many origins, yes. So many origins, yeah. Um, I founded an intercollegiate journal when I was a freshman in college and um, I wanted an advisory board populated with people who would intimidate my writers into submitting their essays on time. So I wrote to a number of professors and public intellectuals asking them if they would be willing to serve on the advisory board. And Leon was one of those people. I'd never met him before that. Um, and he said, yes, so that's, that's actually how we met. All right. Yes, and um, one later we worked together on a, book of my essays and uh, stayed in touch. Uh, and then one day, one magical afternoon, I was sitting in the living room of an old and dear uh, friend and a prosperous friend mm -hmm. who suddenly announced that he was tired of not reading me and not reading my writers and that he put aside a jaw-dropping amount of money for us to start a journal. And um, I was, of course, uh, happy about that. And since I've, I've always mm -hmm. liked to work with very, very, very small staffs, with the smallest staff possible, mm -hmm. because you get more done that way. I mean, if you, if you know your own mind and you know what you want and you've identified a person with whom there's some intellectual sympathy and so on, then I just, so I immediately thought of Celeste and I called her and I said, I think this is right, that uh, there's great news. I don't know what it's going to be called yet, but would you like the job of managing editor? And she thought about it for about um, a half a second and said, yes. So the, the institution was staffed. Uh, and that, that's how it started. We have a very, um, there's a great deal of sympathy between us intellectually and otherwise. And we work together well, and we're also interested in the same kinds of intellectual standards. So it was a, it was a pleasure to, to be able to hire her. Awesome. Yeah. So basically, I'm speaking to the entire editorial staff of the journal. You're, right that's now. it. This is it. That's us, correct. Us plus our publisher who's not on the editorial staff, but that the three of us are the entire outfit. Oh, there we go. Okay. I should like to begin by saying that it, Liberties is probably the best thing that has ever come out of the pandemic or any pandemic. Oh, uh, oh thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I, I hope I'm not, I, I don't come off as too flattering, but is truly what oh, I you're think. making me blush, and I'm not famous for blushing. Yes, <laughs> just yeah, it's um, it's really in the age of you know uh, polarization and pretty much a partisan hackery political writing. I mean, this is just a breath of fresh air. Um, allow me to give a description of the journal, and you guys can see if that is fitting. Um, mm -hmm. It's a quarterly journal, uh, so four issues per year. Uh, and uh, each issue is uh, what hundreds of pages long, and about three hundred fifty. Ah, the latest one. There we go. Yeah, I, I have the digital subscription, so there's no page count. So that's right. But they're each about yeah. three fifty. Uh huh. And 
there is a mixture of uh, prose and poetry. Um, mm -hmm. the, the prose essays are very long and they are written by talented, uh, established or new writers um, of, uh, the, of, a wide, of a wide political spectrum, conservatives, liberals, and progressives alike. And each of them provide a very insightful perspective on a political matter, not necessarily current, but thematically, mm -hmm. well, something that has been occurring, recurring in American politics and beyond. And obviously there's an art section too, which uh, Celeste is a one, uh, one example of such a writer. And I shall get into that in, in a bit, but yeah, I hope that's a fitting description of what the journal is about. It is, it is. I would, I would only revise it in the following way. Yeah. There are indeed liberals, progressives and conservatives who write, but mm -hmm. all of them accept as a larger framework what we call the liberal order. In mm -hmm. other words, um, we are not interested in enemies of liberalism. One of, the, one of the purposes of the journal is to revive and rehabilitate and refresh uh, liberalism and to make it clear to our readers that mm -hmm. liberalism conceived one way or another. There's no doctrinaire catechismic definition of liberalism but conceived one way or another is the only way out of our crisis. Um, I don't know that all of our writers would say it would, would describe themselves as liberals, but what they write for us is consistent with liberalism. That is what they believe. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know that all of them would say that they believe it. I mean, it's totally consistent with whatever they write for us, of course, they believe. That's and, what I mean, yeah. Yeah, they would, they would probably write elsewhere things that would be inconsistent with what we believe. They um, might. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think it's one of the things that we, I think one of the things that is unique about us, or at least different from most other publications right now, is that if you got all of our writers in a room together and asked them what they thought about a given subject, um, they wouldn't all agree with each other. Yeah. And that's okay with us. Yes, I, I get that impression too. Um, so as I've said, um, Leon, you were for 30 or so years, the literary editor of the New Republic, which uh, for a time was uh, considered basically the liberal answer to say National Review. And it, it was held in high regard as the magazine to go for liberal politics. So uh, in, in the nicest possible way or in the least nicest possible way, how would you describe uh, the New Republic magazine now? What would I find in the latest issue of the magazine? Nothing that you wouldn't find in the Nation or the New York Review of Books or the New Yorker or the Atlantic, or there is a great uniformity of progressive opinion mm -hmm. in American intellectual journalism right now. Uh, you know, it's um, the New Republic is edited by a very fine man and it is, um, and every once in a while, there's something in there that that I would like to read, but I'm I'm afraid that it is uh, it doesn't it it often doesn't add that much to the conversation. Um, when we when we had it, meaning when Marty Peretz and I and Michael Kinsley and Rick Hertzberg and the late Charles Krauthammer, and mm -hmm. when we had it, uh, we really were a bunch of angry liberals who many people thought were conservatives. Our role was twofold. It was to put intellectual pressure on liberalism so as to improve it because it had become very sanctimonious. I mean, it's often very sanctimonious. Uh, and the second one was to um, give an example of a group of thoughtful people who quarreled among ourselves. We did not agree with each other about everything. Uh, and it was, the, those were the, for me, the two most attractive characteristics of the magazine. Irving Howe, who was a great American critic and writer, um, 
once said that if you read a single issue of the New Republic cover to cover, you become cross-eyed <laughs> because it just doesn't add up. <laughs> and we thought that's exactly right. Uh, yeah, which is why it was very exciting and why we had no movement at our back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, speaking of, yeah, it's, um, would you attribute, say, the depth of um, print journalism? Of course, uh, Liberties is one of the few uh, journalistic outlets that offers a print version, uh, or the fact that uh, American politics, as well as the politics of the West, has been so uh, acidic and intoxicating these days to the fact that most political writing, whether that is in liberal, uh, liberal publications or conservative uh, tend to be very devoid of insight. Well, I, I, I'll just answer this and then Celeste can come in. I think that um, there, it was a perfect storm in that the economic basis for certain, for a certain kind of journalism was cut off at the knees first by the 2008 recession and then by the internet mm -hmm. and that American political discourse became uh, regimented ideologically so that everybody divided up into gangs and into camps. Uh, that tends to be not good for thinking and writing. Uh, you know, the, the defenses of orthodoxy can be very witty and beautifully written, as in C.S. Lewis or Chesterton, or for that matter, a great many Marxist writers. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you, you know what you're going to get when you, when you open the book, as it were. So the, intellectually, the situation has become... Uh, it's somewhat simplified. It's getting complicated and a little more interesting now because there are these um, dangerous fringe groups intellectually that need to be argued against. So the, the battle is getting a little more complicated. But, um, but no, and then there is the problem of the complete degeneration of the English language in American public speech. Uh, it's astonishing. You know, I, it, it gets lower and lower and lower. I mean, you know, people have marveled about this before. And there was a time when, when it was considered a masterpiece of political oratory when Ronald Reagan turned to Walter Mondale and said, where's the beef? And that was supposed to be eloquence of, at, at, at its most effective. Um, but now with the rise of Twitter and the acceleration of, thought and speed and everything else, um, the quality of the language, meaning also the quality of the thought, because they usually run together, uh, has, is, it, it's not a golden age for that. Um, I think that this is a subject that comes up a lot, especially you know when people are talking about liberties because the book, it's the physical thing is so thick. Um, and one thing that I think gets short shrift is that the, the media ch change, the way that the way that people go about ingesting news or information or opinions or takes morphed. But um, but people didn't. And so I, I don't think that there is a dearth of thoughtful people or of readers, proper readers for liberties. That's a good um, way to put it. Yeah, I, I think that that's an important way to look at it, because um, the, the kinds of people who stay up late, late reading books didn't die out. They're still there and they're still hungry to be fed. It's just that they're not being fed by the same uh, institutions anymore. So I, 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 don't, I don't believe that um, everybody got dumber or less thoughtful or that the number of people who are interested in, in um, nuanced and learned discourse uh, suddenly diminished significantly. I think that the media took a gamble and it was a bad one. Um, they bet that they would they would be able to survive the internet if they got shallower and simpler mm -hmm. and shorter. Um, and I do think that there we're beginning to see that we're beginning to see mainstream publications decide that that maybe was a bad idea. Um, you know, the Washington Post is now expanding its book section. Um, there are 
lots of publications that are doing this thing called the long read, which is supposed to be like this cool new thing, which is um, the same, you know, it's, it's used one- to be called an essay. Yeah. Used to be called an essay. And you know, it's like one, one essay that is as long as all of the essays in Liberties. Um, so I, I just, I think that like, this is, this has been a trend. It's been a very powerful trend and it's, um, it's been very visible because it's happened at, um, like the apex of the culture of the cultural center in America. But it, I don't think that the trickle down has been as severe. So as So there's, so I'm well. sorry for um, barging in. There is some good news. There are, I find, I mean, I'm about to turn 70. So pardon me if I use this phrase, but I find that young people, um, more and more, I see the emergence of good old fashioned journals, um, which they proudly put out, not just online, but also on paper. Um, you know, I have, I have worries about the quality of some of these journals and uh, the, the intellectual foundations of some of them, but the fact is there seems to be a certain amount of um, young people seem to seem to grasp not just the fun, but the grandeur of an old fashioned journal of ideas. And that's very exciting. It is. Yeah. And of course, Leon, you mentioned that the um, focus of liberties is to preserve uh, political liberalism and in, and I, this is a this is a very transgressive opinion, but I think that one of the good things that the uh, Russia's war in Ukraine has brought is that we now know who the enemies of liberalism are. They have uh, officially risen to the surface, and you know this is some. Um, there was this um, Fox News clip. I, I assume that none of us are frequent Fox News watchers, but uh, yes, yes. I saw these clips being shared on social media uh, where two uh, personalities well known to both the right and the left, uh, Tucker Carlson and Glenn Greenwald, agreeing with each other, but they agree with each other on all the wrong things. And one of right. that being that liberalism is dead. And, you know, of course, uh, yeah. Being a polemic, uh, polemicist as I am, I would say that they are both frauds in their certain ways. But um, yeah, it is. It seems to be me that the only ideology that unites both the left and the right of American or generally Western politics is that liberalism is dead, and uh, we need to replace it somehow. Um, and of course, you. Well, let me say that I'm enormously excited to learn that what that your analysis which is absolutely the correct one okay. has made it all the way to vietnam because that is exactly right the war in ukraine putin's invasion of ukraine is the most clarifying event of our time and in one's opinion about that war there's nowhere to hide um, it, it is, the, tell me what you think of, if someone, tell me what someone thinks about this war and I can, I'll generate the rest of their worldview from that opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I just wrote a long essay about this, which I'll send to you so you can read it, um, for the next issue of Liberties. But oh, thank you. yes, I think that's right. Zelensky is right now our great teacher mm -hmm. and it is clear that Putin launched this war for one reason and one reason only, which is to stop the spread of liberal democracy and to uh, lay down the line for authoritarian government. And um, th that is precisely the issue that's being fought on the battlefield. And the Ukrainians will say so also. The Ukrainians are not fighting for a mystical nationalism of their own, and they're not fighting for the ethnic integrity of their country and they're not fighting for, uh, because a, a, a branch of the Orthodox Church says they should, they're fighting because they wish to live as liberal Democrats. Uh, and so your analysis was exactly right and it is exposed, which is often the case. This was the case in Europe in 1920s and 30s. It has exposed the ironic and disgusting convergence of 
ideas between the hard left and the hard right. Uh, the, it's an old story now, but basically they can live with each other, but it's the liberals they have to kill. Uh, and so here we are to say that that's not going to be possible. Yes, and I think speaking as someone who's a citizen of Vietnam, um, you know, uh, liberal democracy has not come to our shores yet. And so when we see it in yeah. other places, when we see that the people who are living in Europe and America are both material, materially more free and, and well, uh, more assertive of their individual identities, well, that mm -hmm. is something that we want. But of course, as I've seen in American media, there are a growing number of people who have enjoyed that those liberties, uh, to insert the pun, um, seems to be- Long, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Have, have you, has your podcast gotten you into trouble? Um, so far, no. Uh, but what, what kind of trouble would that be? I guess maybe with the state, but I'm guessing- yeah. um, Maybe not. Oh. No, good, good. So, trouble uh, with society is what a podcast is for. I was talking about the state. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, okay. as I was saying, uh, thank you for your concern. By the way, I hope that nothing reaches me that I should be worried about. But yeah, um, it seems to me that people who are in America and Europe who have been fed this, uh, these liberties, who have lived with them for all their lives, uh, seems very much ungrateful of it and. Uh, this used to be, you know, because I'm a bit more of a conservative minded person, uh, I find I find and I mock these examples on the left, but it seems to me that after the Ukrainian war and of course after Trump got elected, um, mm -hmm. I find that a growing, a growing faction of the right opposes liberalism as well, often in a very gross manner. Yes. We have liberals have to fight more than one battle at a time. They have to fight in politics and they have to fight in culture. They're separate realms and they have to fight the progressive left and they have to fight the post-liberal right. And it was always this way. Unfortunately, it was never, it had been a long time since the situation was quite as sharp as it is now and as ugly as it is now. Uh, but liberals have a lot of work to do in that regard. Yes. Um, let's move on to culture, but uh, may I say something that is not too polemic to some, uh, and that is uh, Russian aggression on Ukraine is not a reason to cancel uh, Dostoevsky and uh, Tchaikovsky. Absolutely. Obviously listen to appreciate their beauty without, you know, <clears throat> taking regard of what Russia has become now. Uh, Even but, though Dostoevsky would have supported the war. But yes, yes, yeah, you're that's, right. Uh, that's <laughs> an unfortunate part of his, uh, well, biography. And yeah. you know, <laughs> um, now let's get into today contemporary art criticism, which I find intolerable. And um, maybe Celeste can uh, chime in on this one, although this is open to both. Um, I cannot read. Uh, the books and art section of any newspaper or magazine anymore. Um, even the ones that I, that fit my you know, political worldview, because um, it seems to me that criticism of art has been heavily politicized and everyone seems to be interpreting either a new film or a new piece of music or a new theater piece in their own within their own political lens and they fail to appreciate the aesthetic qualities of the art piece or the say the intent or the intent of the author so um what has happened to this what has happened to art criticism well i mean i'm sure that people have not stopped appreciating art but there must be some way for uh, the the art critics of the world and the literary editors of the world to to uh, do better in this regard to foster this appreciation more and the floor is yours what do you think uh, I think that 
both in the art world itself, so amongst artists and gallerists and curators, um, and and in the uh, and in the media. But I think that I think that th this trend probably manifests. They both are very far to the left, and they're pushing farther left. Um, but it manifests a little bit differently in both of those places, although you can see it in both places. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're both victim to the complete politicization of so many inappropriate aspects of human life, which is sort of a dominant trend overall in, in this country and probably at the West entirely. Mm -hmm. um, there, you're right that art, the gal galleries in say New York and the big museums deciding which artists to show are, are concerned with um, aligning themselves politically. I think that every I think the galleries and the museums are almost across the board to the left, mm -hmm. um, and you're I think you're right to point out that both conservative art criticism and progressive art criticism progressive is like the dominant trend in the mainstream media. But there are there are some um, art critics today who have made a bit of a reputation for themselves by being conservative, and basically all mm -hmm. they do is condemn the art for being. Um, absurdly and blatantly politicized yes. they don't can they don't criticize it on the basis of the art the quality of the art itself much of which is bad but um some of it is not bad mm -hmm. um there there are even artists who are very political whose work is good Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, if you think that the, if you think that the politicization of art is inappropriate, then a, an honest critic would say both that the politicization is inappropriate and that the art is good. Um, but I've noticed that when there is art criticism in um, a conservative or a right leaning publication, I think that there are lots of publications now that wouldn't call themselves conservative, but they would, they would like identify themselves with the cancel cancel culture movement. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they will have an art critic and th that art critic's only job is to point out how ridiculous the politics of the artists are. Um, and I think that's just as bad uh, because it's conceding, it's just contributing to the politicization of this, that realm of human life, which is inappropriate. Um, and, you know, so boring, it's boring. Um, I think that that's one of my biggest problems with it. It's difficult to find art criticism now that is, serious artistically, um, whereas that didn't used to be true, you know, 50 years ago. I think Celeste is absolutely right. This is not a golden age for looking at art as art. Um, mm -hmm. Art is now deemed as an instrument to a larger end, usually a political one, um, and as a weapon in the struggle. Uh, we've seen this before, there have been other times when political movements uh, have successfully uh, taken over the aesthetic realm uh, and thereby provoked uh, a fight, an intellectual fight for the autonomy of art and for the legitimacy of art uh, as such, not, not any kind of stupid denial that art has social origins or a social place or takes place in a social setting or all of this is so true that it's that they're truisms mm -hmm. but right now it is the social dimension of art and the social origins of art and the social utility of art that is considered to be art's most important aspect and you can see it in a lot of the art that is reviewed, there's a lot that Celeste points out that isn't reviewed. There's, mm -hmm. there, there are still good painters and artists working out there because art is uh, a constant feature of human life mm -hmm. uh, in, its, in its primary, in its essence. They're there, um, but they're being overwhelmed by the tendentious and dogmatic coverage that, 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 utilitarian or politicized artists now receive. I also want to say that there are, if you, if you are the kind of person who pays attention to this, these things, you know that there are very serious shows um, there that are 
being put on all the time in major museums all over the world. And the catalogs for those shows are works of scholarship. Um, there are, you know, for example, um, the best, the best show I've ever seen in my life and the most learned um, was the Cezanne show at MoMA last summer. Um, the which, drawings, yeah. The drawings and the watercolors, yeah. um, which was just overwhelming. It was so learned. Um, it was enormous. So much money had been poured into a really worthy endeavor, which was trying to get all of Cezanne's drawings and watercolors in a single place. And a lot of them are in private collections. And so a lot of the stuff that was on view there for just a couple of months um, will not be seen again for, for many decades. And maybe some of it will never be seen again for the pop, open to the public. Um, and that was a show that if you were an art lover, you knew about it. And if you were not, you didn't. Um, it was earth shattering. People traveled all over the, from all over the world to see it. And um, if you were, say, you're running a publication that is dedicated to calling out cancel culture. And so you often publish essays about art criticism that is like condemning art for being politically like so overwhelmingly left wing, you wouldn't cover that show. Um, and if you, if you read publications like that, you wouldn't have known about that show. Um, because it or doesn't you would have discovered, excuse me, that Cezanne objectified his wife. No, no, no. That's for the those are for the progressives, and they yes. and that's, you know. But I'm talking about the anti-progressives, oh, oh, yeah. the people who you would think would be interested in protecting a certain traditional conservative, um, the legacy of of an artist who is a traditional conservative figure like Cezanne. Um, oh. You wouldn't be interested in that. You wouldn't be interested in trying to honor. Um, the enormous effort of those curators and historians who labor, it was a labor of um, great learnedness and, and scholarship to pr produce that show. Um, and you just would not know about that. So I think that that's a really, that's a really crushing condemnation of the kinds of people who make a lot of hay about the politicization of the art world. And I'm not saying that it's not true. It absolutely is true. Um, but if you believe in, you know, protecting traditionalism, then you have to, you know, you know, you have to walk the walk. Yeah, yeah of course, um, um, you know, as someone who's not born of the Western framework of culture, I mean, I've learned to appreciate it and it should be, it should be preserved, uh, the art, the culture and the philosophy of it, even though that, you know, if you hear from much of the left these days, all of Western culture is that just a history of uh, exploitation and subjugation of the non-Western population. So um, let's move on to how I think um, before we before I address the topic of cancel culture, I should like to discuss how because of this uh, these like waves of politicized like art criticism, a lot of contemporary art these days and. You know, as in a lot of them in all sorts of mediums, uh, film, theater, music has been increasingly politicized. Of course, uh, people of the right needs to be cautious of religion being politicized, as in any of them, not just limited to Christianity. Uh, Dion, of course, you've uh, written an excellent essay uh, in the latest issue about that exact topic. But um, in terms of the liberals and the left, uh, I think one chief concern would be the politicization of the arts. And, and it has not been just in contemporary arts, it is also the arts of the past, the classical music and classical art. And it has been deemed by you know, a faction of, uh, I guess, uh, Black Lives Matter activism, for example, that, uh, the classical music or even classical art fails to either feature uh, enough people of color or is uh, subliminally a, um, an expression of the author's um, disdain for anything non-Western. So um, yeah, um, how should you address this, uh, this uh, warped worldview of the beautiful? Well, I would say two things. The first one is that what matters most is what questions you approach art with. You can ask many, many questions of art. And when one speaks about the autonomy of art, 
its independence of its origins, its ability to express more than just the group or that or or the social and economic setting in which it was made. <laughs> One isn't being a kind of crazy mystical formulist who believes that art has nothing whatsoever to do with reality. Of course it does. But the important thing is not to reduce any realm of life to any other realm of life. So are there economic explanations or economic causalities even for American abstract painting? Yes. Is that the most interesting thing about American abstract painting? No. Uh, so the, the, the point is, the first question that one must ask of art uh, is an aesthetic question. Uh, what is it? What does it mean? How does it work? What is beauty? Uh, and so on. Um, the problem is that there is now a tyranny of one of the standpoints from which art may be viewed over all the other standpoints from which art may be viewed. So that has to be corrected. That's what this politicization thing is. And the idea that art needs to be useful in a struggle when in fact the non or anti-utilitarian nature of art is very close to its essence. The second thing I would say is that um, after, you know, the West did not know a lot about the East for a very long time, and the East did not know a lot about the West for a very long time. Uh, there were relations of power or, and powerlessness that, 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 that determined the nature of some of those relations. Um, but there are, uh, whereas it certainly was the case that when you look at pictures by Rubens or uh, by a great many other European painters and, and, and composers, you are hearing Western sounds composed often under the aegis of Western political patronage. Uh, all that is true, but anybody who reduces all of what they see and hear to that political patronage or to speaking more generally imperialism may as well be blind and deaf because they are not, they're not getting what art can give them. Again, it's the, uh, you know, not everything that was done in an, by an imperialist society was an imperialist thing. Mm -hmm. When two people, when a, when a young man and a young woman fell in love in England in the 18th century, it was not a romance between two imperialists. I mean, these were human beings with human aspirations and which may or may not be universal. Some of them certainly are, but not everything can be reduced to the political nature of the society in which it happens. Uh, and again, this mistake, and that is a larger mistake than the politicization of art. That is the denial that even in imperialist and authoritarian societies, and by the way, some of these imperialist societies were not at all authoritarian, which complicates the analysis, that e but even in these imperialist societies, there were not realms of life that were independent of the foreign and economic policies that the government practiced. I mean, it's stupid to think otherwise. It really is. And uh, it's the same with the idea of democracy. I'm sorry to be going on for too long, but the provenance of an idea says nothing about its truth. And it may be that John Locke was born in England and not in say Vietnam, and that Thomas Jefferson was born in America and not in China. But the fact remains that the, their origins do not vitiate the universal concepts that they try to introduce, unless you believe that there's no such thing as universalism, in which case I, my heart breaks for you, not for you, Chuang, but for anyone who believes such a thing, because then they're living in a very um, unattractive and parochial and nasty world. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um... I should say that, of course, um, 
my country of Vietnam was uh, one of the colonies of France. And yes. um, you know, it was a, in the history books that I've been taught, it was a very brutal time. Um, nevertheless, I mean, when I approach uh, French art, uh, French cinema, and of course, French cuisine, I don't find myself being, was it a former colonial subject, uh, you know, bowing down to his you know, imperial oppressor. I feel like just someone enjoying and appreciating and learning about a culture wholly different from my own. And I should say that there well, wasn't... Then you are, let me say that you are a man, first of all, who has the fundamental gift of making distinctions without which thought cannot advance. And yes. let me also say, and I think Celeste would agree with this, what you just said about uh, the French tradition, I, as a Jew, feel about many aspects of the Christian and Western tradition. Mm -hmm. And the uh, French tradition. <laughs> and the French tradition, exactly, good point. Uh, so that, that, that's right, these distinctions, it is not treasonous. You'd, one doesn't betray one's group in making these distinctions, not at all. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and thank you for your compliment. Um, you, uh, I'm glad you mentioned distinctions because I, this is something that I'm going to be asking, uh, and that is the distinction between uh, the art and the artist. Uh, lots of uh, talk today, uh, most recently about um, Norman Mailer, who's a new, whose latest collection of essay, the publication of it has sparked an uproar because uh, of uh, Mailer's is less than perfect politics as well as personal life, as well as his views on, of oh, course, yeah. his views on black people and women are, you know, not kosher these days. <laughs> but uh, I- He was a very unattractive figure. Yes, <laughs> yes, um, but, uh, because since I, I'm having you guys on, I, uh, I'm going to take this conversation, this question in a more personal direction, because uh, I'm assuming that both of you guys are of your Jewish descent. Um, yeah. And um, there have been uh, great uh, artists of the past, um, that some that I really enjoy. Let's say um, my favorite poet is T.S. Eliot. My favorite uh, operatist is uh, Richard Wagner. Um, I'm also a student of the Catholic tradition. I'm on my way to becoming a practitioner of Roman Catholicism. All of these, right? yes. All of these three elements, of course, uh, share one very ugly thing in common, and that is anti-Semitism. Uh, so how do you, uh, Leon and Celeste, uh, square that with Say the excellence of uh, their art, as well as the art and the philosophy and the culture of Catholicism. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah, I, I, I'm gonna answer this question uh, by by responding to your previous question, the previous conversation, because I think that it's a, it's a good image for how I I don't I don't square it. Basically, is what I'm going to say, but I'll I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, if, if I walk at night alone in Paris, um, I'm in two Parises in my mind. I'm in a Paris that is rich in cultural history that I adore and feel at home in. And I'm also in a Paris that rounded up Jews in 1942 and 43 and sent them to Drancy and then to Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And I feel both of those I feel both of those spaces and both the weight of both of those histories with equal intensity at the same time. Um, sometimes one overwhelms me and sometimes the other does, but both of them are present for me. Um, and one does not exclude me from the other. Um, I, don't, I don't feel I'm being parochial by, um, you know, wincing. Um, when I realized that, you know, a Jew that frequented a restaurant that I le just left was rounded up and killed, um, you know, after, after he had spent many years enjoying those streets and feeling at home in them. I don't feel like that's a betrayal of my um, universalism or my loyalty to um, the artistic traditions that I love. Um, and I don't feel that I'm betraying my Jewish origins by admiring an artist whom I know was a, an anti-Semite. Um, and I think that it's important 
to allow both of those things to have their own realms. So if I'm thinking about history, then I'm not doing a disservice to the cultural tradition by holding particular artists to account and to by remembering that they were guilty of anti-Semitism. Um, and if I'm thinking about the quality of their art, um, my responsibility is to set that subject aside and really just consider that tradition exclusively. Uh, and I think it's possible to do both of these things. I think that you have to do it. Um, sometimes you have to do it in the same conversation. You know, if you're giving a lecture about a particular artist who you know was guilty of anti-Semitism, there is a place in that conversation, in, the, in that lecture for um, a conversation about the quality of their art. And there is a place in that lecture for you know, the, their um, complicity with anti-Semitism. And I don't think that that's a, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's just really difficult. Um, and that's okay. I think Celeste put it beautifully. I just want to add that, um, you know, uh, members of minority groups of any kind are always going to have this problem. Or people who whose tradition includes stories of oppression are always going to have this problem. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways of triumphing over oppression, either in the past or in the present, is not letting it to completely dominate your consciousness and your sense of what is important. There were people who gave lectures. There was a Polish painter who lectured on Proust in a concentration camp. Wow. There was a great rabbi who gave astonishing sermons and lectures in the Warsaw Ghetto. We have slave songs and oral poetry that were produced on the plantation. Uh, even in the midst of oppression, even in the midst of oppression, one is never just oppressed, uh, ever, mm. ever, unless one agrees to surrender one's mind or one's soul to one's circumstances. But I think it's safe to say that one of the best, uh, that we are the creatures, we are, that human beings are the creatures on this earth who can actually exceed their circumstances. And so um, one needs to prepare oneself mentally not to add up or to not add up and to make decisions. I mean, there are times when I'm in certain countries in Poland or in Ukraine, for example, uh, whose causes I have supported in various ways since the crackdown on solidarity in 1981, mm -hmm. uh, when I have to shut a part of myself off because um, there, I have inherited memories from my parents and from others about cruelties that were done to my people by those peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously I'm speaking in gross generalities and I don't believe in collective responsibility exactly, but I have to shut a part of myself off. And I'm willing to shut a part of myself off because if I don't, I will deprive myself of a significant part of my spiritual education. Uh, you know, it would be um, when I listen to, I, I will admit, I, I, I'm a, I'm, I love Wagner, but I will admit that the Meistersinger von Nuremberg, that opera, I can't quite listen to. And I admit that it's because it brings his repulsive anti-Semitism just a little too close for comfort. So I sacrifice one of his operas, but I will never sacrifice Tristan or Parsifal or The Ring mm -hmm. uh, because of what happened. I will simply uh, divide myself. I will simply divide myself. And the irony, I guess, is that when I divide myself so, so as to make my, this beauty accessible to me, somehow when I encounter it, it then it becomes accessible to all of me, mm -hmm. the way great art always does. So it's a, it's a mental procedure that, that, that the children of, uh, or grandchildren or great-grandchildren of adversity have to learn to, to do. Yes. You know, um... Yeah, it, to put it on a lighter note, it 
No, your answer reminds me of this one episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, where Larry David <laughs> comes live Richard Wagner, and then every every one of his like Jewish friends uh, thinks he's an anti-Semite and race traitor. And I just thought, yes, yes. Um, I I think that one of the very underrated virtues of today's society and definitely very much denigrated is forgiveness. Uh, Leon, you've uh, said multiple times uh, that you will never forgive unforgiveness. And uh, I'm, again, my apologies if uh, I bring no. up your episode of uh, being canceled. No, but, no, no. Um, I'm... Uh, the... Ask, ask whatever you'd like to ask. Yes, um, but um, I think that is why politics and, of course, art criticism these days have been so calcified because we are unwilling to forgive our opponents' transgressions. So, um, in in uh, your own words, uh, like I'm asking, like a first grader or something, um, how would you bring it? How would you state the importance of forgiveness as a virtue? Forgiveness is a huge subject and anyone who is either forgiven or needed forgiveness understands how difficult it is. Everybody likes to flatter themselves that they are forgiven. They are not. Mm -hmm. They are not. Um, as a, we are becoming an unforgiving society in which nobody any longer just makes mistakes. They commit crimes mm -hmm. uh, and every mistake is a crime. And every mistake is meant, by the way, there are crimes, of course, don't get me wrong, but that we spoke of distinctions earlier. We have to make them, you know, the most one, perhaps the central feature of justice and all this cancellation comes is done by by warriors for justice the the perhaps the central feature of justice is proportionality and one may work in a just cause but if one commits a disproportionate act then one has vitiated the justice of one's cause yes john brown versus and, dave lincoln uh, well you got it my goodness yes are you sure you're in hanoi uh <laughs> yes um uh Yes, John Brown versus Abraham Lincoln. I mean, when I, all my life, since I was a young man, there are these questions one asks oneself, what would I have been if I had lived in this time or in that time? And if I had lived in mid 19th century America, I used to ask myself, would I have been a radical abolitionist or a moderate abolitionist? And I, I flatter myself that I would certainly have been an abolitionist. But I know that I would have been a moderate abolitionist because I would have regarded John Brown's uh, as a terrorist mm -hmm. and his murder of innocent people would have been unacceptable to me. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we get into the business of making distinctions. Um, I have discovered the importance of forgiveness in a whole new way since my experience. Um, I, with the exception of a few people who, as far as I'm concerned, out and out betrayed me, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, uh, I am now a great apostle of forgiveness. Sometimes when I talk about forgiveness, I can be mistaken for a Christian, which is usually not the case. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's something that we have to think about as a society, as a culture. Uh, it is not easy to do, and many people believe that they have much larger hearts than they in fact do. Yeah, that's true. And they really do. I mean, they don't, they're wrong about their, about their, um, about their own largeness. Now, they can enlarge themselves. I mean, we're always learning and experience is a, is a moral education and so on. But um, I've come to the conclusion that until American society learns forgiveness, we are going to stay down river. Uh, and I, you know, anyway, I will, at some point I will write about 
not forgiveness. There have been some very fine thinkers about forgiveness. I want to write more on the subject of unforgivingness mm -hmm. uh, because it's not it's not exactly the same subject. Yes, um, Celeste. Yeah, I think that um, I think Leon is right that the extremism vitiates or it, it, it delegitimates the causes that it's supposed to further. Uh, I think that basically the way that I interpret this now, and it's, it's it, I think it's, it had calmed down a little bit, but there are still examples of this complete puritanical spirit that is totally intolerant and it feels inhuman and it also feels ridiculous. Um, I guess the most recent example that is on my mind is the Dave Weigel um, Washington Post thing. Um, do you know about this? Maybe you're lucky enough to be far enough away that you don't have to know about this. Uh, please um, enlighten me. Oh God, it's just awful. This the Dave Weigel, who has been at the Washington Post for a, a long time, retweeted a joke that, um, oh God, it was something like, all women are um all women are bi all women are bi it's either mm. bipolar or bisexual and he retweeted it and it's like yeah that is a gross joke um but a, a person who works with him a co-worker of his screenshotted and said something like you know it's great to be at a workplace where this kind of thing is allowed to be retweeted by the people who work there and now he's been suspended for a month without pay um from the post and you know actually I think that there has been a lot of pushback against the Post for doing what they did. A lot of prominent um, writers have said, you know, this is crazy and Dave Weigel is a great guy and, you know, he doesn't deserve this. And I think actually four years ago, there would have been a lot less support for him than he has now, but he's still been suspended for a month without pay. Um, and the idea that the cause of feminism was furthered by this person, you know, retweeting this thing. Um, I mean, condemning him for retweeting this thing is just, it just seems, it's a very cynical idea to me that um, this woman should be praised for that. Um, and it feels like, it just, it just feels so far away from anything really substantial that can be done for, um, for women. And I'm not saying, I, I don't believe that, um, the, like feminism is an antiquated movement because everything that a woman could possibly want in modern society has already been given her. I know that there are people who think this um, and it bothers me. Um, I know that there are, I think probably in, in retaliation to the um, really powerful progressive shift to the left, um, there, are, there are lots of people who ordinarily wouldn't, wouldn't think this way, who just feel as if feminism is completely ridiculous and not necessary anymore. Um, and I think that that's unfortunate. I think that it's certainly untrue. Uh, you know, if, if Roe v. Wade is overturned this summer, which it, which it looks like it, it will be, um, that seems to me pretty definitive proof that that's the wrong way to be thinking and conceiving of society. Um, but yeah, I think I, I, I basically agree with Leon that it just feels like completely inconsistent with the values that it is supposed to be furthering. And I'm, I'm very cynical about it. Um, I hope that I, I don't think that 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 the impulse has receded, but I do think that I, I, I am hopeful that there have been um, the, the the like ordinary people who kind of felt the tsunami overwhelm them. So years ago and were too afraid to say publicly I don't stand with these people I think that those th that more of them have come forward and said like this is cruel mm. um which is why Dave Weigel has been supported by people publicly whereas I, I think several years if this had happened several years ago he would not have been mm -hmm. um but yeah I think that this is this is one of the fights that liberties is supposed to stand for and it's not just that we believe in um, forgiveness. It's also that we believe in clear headedness. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that's an important, it's an important thing to stand for because people are afraid. You know, there is one, there is a, one way to think about it that, I mean, I've been thinking about this lately, which is to ask the question, what are the ethical responsibilities of victims? Uh, it's often assumed that if you are a victim, you're done. You have no responsibilities. Everybody else 
has responsibilities towards you. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking here about circumstances in which people were actually in some way we can agree on victimized, not in circumstances in which somebody heard or read on their phone something that was unpleasant for them to hear or read. They're not victims, they're citizens of an open society. There's a difference. And there, I mean, I have no time for the skinlessness of, 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 of such people. Uh, but in circumstances in which people, let's say, are victims, it is not the case that victims have no ethical duties. And one of their ethical duties is to behave is 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 not to is is to behave proportionately, you know. And, and when we learn how to manage our emotions, one of the things we're taught is to is to react, if you'll pardon the expression, to scale. Mm -hmm. And if we if you react above scale, then you are regarded as a hysteric or as a, a whatever you are. But but the fact that one has been hurt does not give one the right to do whatever one wants or to hurt other people um, or to hurt other people. Uh, that's called a vendetta or vengeance. And we know about that. And it is not uh, a framework with enormous ethical prestige. All right, I, I wanna say something quickly, please. Yeah. Um, sure. First, I, I think that Sometimes if a victim is seeking justice and wants to hurt um, the person who hurt them, that can be appropriate. I think that justice is a perfectly appropriate thing for yes, a victim yes, to watch. Yes, yes, um, yes. I also think that I, I want to distinguish between, you said that it is often assumed that a victim is just owed something and is not often considered what a victim owes. Um, I want to distinguish between the realms and the realms we're talking about right now, the public realms in which vi victims are often feted for their victim status and the very private realms in which a victim endures whatever trauma they've sustained because of their victimhood. Right, um, right. Those are two very different places. Uh, right. And we would be, it would be tragic if we were guilty of the same politicization that we've been condemning over the course of this conversation um, if we treated a victim as if she lives primarily in a political realm where conversations about her victimhood are picked over by the left and the right. Um, right. She right. does. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's I right. just want to point that out. It's important. Yes. It's so important when we're having conversations about this to, to remind ourselves that we're talking about human beings. Um, and that there are many things that we don't see. That's right. Yeah. And that there's a, there are cultural prestiges that could be could be really beneficial to a person in a particular realm but actually has no bearing on the way that she gets through the day when she's just been you know assaulted yes, um, or sustained so, so i just think that that's it's important to remember that yes um, okay go ahead i'm sorry yeah I, I think um i think that's how the me too movement has uh fallen the wayside has come has gone completely off the rails and it of course has to do with forgiveness the Many, in many instances, the women who have been, well, victimized, of course, they, they think of themselves as victims rather than as human beings. And human beings, of course, are capable of forgiveness. And we just don't use that much too often these days. But um, the, for the final question, I would like- Well, to I think I would be careful about, Gen but Chuang, I would be careful about generalizing. Yes. I okay. think it really does depend on the individual. And of course, a lot of what we've been talking about has taken place in the media. Mm -hmm. And most people don't live in media land. And it's very important to remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think they do that privately, of course. Um, um, I, I think, I think of the that most of the I think most victims of, I, if we're talking about sexual assault or most victims of trauma, um, the vast majority of them do not live in realms in which they benefit from the prestigious status of victimhood. That, I think that's well put. Yeah, yeah most, the vast majority um, don't. So if, well if you want to talk about the way that victims self-conceive when they're alone in their rooms, you have to consider the fact that most victims who are alone in their rooms do not live primarily on Twitter. 
um, and so conceive of themselves as hurt people. Now, I'm not saying that hurt people um, don't have personal vendettas, and I'm also not saying that um, the media has fetishized victimhood. I think it's been that's that, that's clear from the whole the, this whole conversation that I do think that. But it's really important not to allow yourself to become, um, you know, a victim of the same hyper politicization that you're trying to work against. Yes. Um, just as art needs to be considered on its own terms, like the, the conversation about trauma and victimhood has to be able to be disentangled from the conversation about politicization. Yeah. Um, what yeah, you I was, experience yes. Oh, yeah, I was thinking about how the woman, uh, Samantha Geimer, that, that's how you pronounce her name, decades later, she made her separate piece with Polanski without the interference yeah. of media and the law. But um, since we're running out of time, I would like to invoke the George Costanza principle and end this on a high note. Um, <laughs> let's say, hypothetically, you are you are to be exiled on a desert island and you are only you are only mandated to consume a work of literary arts whether it's fiction or non-fiction prose or play or poetry since we are in the business of letters uh which author would you choose uh, i'm gonna be a bit more generous and say that you can take another non-literary piece of art with you so uh take your pick does it have to be one book? Because I can fit three or four or five books. Oh, the entire canon of one given author. That oh, wow. Oh. oh. Oh, my God. But you can Jeez. only read them for the rest of your life. Oh, uh, I would be Maimonides or Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. uh, Emerson. Yeah. And which, uh, which other, which one piece of non-literary art would you take with you? Uh, film theater music piece oh oh my oh. god this is hard um <laughs> well beethoven's 12th string quartet mm -hmm. or Mahler's third symphony yeah so that's uh, a murderously difficult choice <laughs> french can can by jean renoir well said uh, yeah um well said. You'll be happy on the island. Exactly. I'd be cheering up. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I'll revise my choice later on in life, but so far is the complete Shakespeare and um, Winter Light by Ingmar Bergman. So, uh, oh, those are, wow. those are my picks. But, oh, uh, oh. <clears throat> yeah. With that, with that being said, uh, Leon Frizotier and Celeste Marcus, thank you so very much for appearing thank on this you program. So much. Yeah, thank you for the great conversation and the thoughtful writing that you do. It's been a long time coming and I'm glad this happened. So uh, well, take care of yourself. A, and, we do podcasts, but this has been a special one. I'm speaking, I think I can speak for Celeste. This has been a very fine conversation and it's really um, moving to find an ally all the way on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wish we wish you well. In Thank that. you so much. Yeah, I wish I could go to America at some point soon. I haven't landed there. But, well, uh, if you do, you let us know. And could you send me your home mailing address? I want to send you something. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, I look forward to it. But uh, until next time, Leon yes. Celeste, shalom. Shalom. shalom.